I'm super excited for this. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Basecamp, where today we have a very special guest and someone whose writing I really enjoy, but also whose work I probably enjoy even more, Michael Gibson. <laughs> you probably, if you've heard of Michael, have heard of him because of his book, Paper Belt on Fire. However, he's in other circles much more well known for being the co-founder of 1517, a very unique type of venture capital fund that doesn't just focus on sort of already proven older entrepreneurs, but rather really young people. They are investing in, in people like pre-college. It's amazing. We're going to talk about all these things, but in this conversation, we are really hoping to dive into his book, which I read as soon as an audiobook was available, Paper Belt on Fire, which really aligns with a lot of the stuff that we're saying is much more eloquently written than the way we would write it. It's it's sort of a mixture of philosophy, prognostication, but also like personal history and history of the 1517 Fund, which is absolutely mm. fascinating. So we're really excited to talk with you about it. Would you like to know more? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, thanks for the kind words as well, both about, you know, whatever my writing style, but also <laughs> about what we're doing. Yeah, the book, I, I maybe, I was like, well, how would I boil it down? I said something like, because why would I have memoir in philosophy and then, you know, behind the scenes account of venture capital and backing young people? I think, I, I think it comes down to strange people do strange things. <laughs> and when the times get tough, the weird go pro. And I wanted to take people behind the scenes and add some color and story to you know, some of these characters I've worked with over the years. Um, one, one thing, I guess, part of my bio, okay, why tell this story is the, we, we have Danielle Strachman, my co-founder of 1517. We helped Peter Thiel start his fellowship program in 2010. And that was a, a program where $100,000 was given to 20 individuals a year. The two conditions were one, you had to be 19 and under to apply. And two, you couldn't be enrolled in university. So you had to drop out or take time off or, or maybe you never went. Mm -hmm. And across five years of co-running that program, we saw incredible things come out of it. We you know, Most notable examples are helping Vitalik Buterin launch Ethereum. Dylan Fields created a company called Figma that was acquired by Adobe for $20 billion last year. Austin Russell founded a company called Luminar Technologies. They make a LiDAR system for cars. They went public in 2020. So the, the Teal Fellowship had a lot of great successes. And uh, there's a independent, this guy is probably the best venture capital analyst in terms of being an outsider at CB Insights. And, and he put up a tweet, in fact, last week where he, he did a deep dive on the success of the Teal Fellowship. And he, he posted the, the hit rate, like how many of these people, if there's 20 people in every class, you know, what's the rate at which people create, you know, unicorn billion dollar businesses. And, 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 you know, his conclusions were like, wow, this hit rate is something like 7%, which in the world of venture capital is, is quite astonishing. So, you know, there's this program out there that, that the world hasn't really heard about mainly because Peter Thiel is, is persona non grata. The media hates him. The publishing world hates him. And so no one wanted to hear this story. And since I was there and part of it, I, I, that was a story I wanted to tell. So there's two things I wanted to, mm -hmm. to discuss really quickly tied to what you just said. The second one we'll, we'll talk about next, which is is how the media like tried to keep your book from being promoted, I think mm -hmm. as much as it otherwise would have been given you know, about how big the things you guys are doing actually are. But the first thing I wanted to talk about, which is really interesting, is within Silicon Valley. So sometimes some of our listeners, they say they watch us to sort of understand what I guess like elite society is thinking or whatever. With the fall of universities as good judges of people's competence, hmm. the highest status symbol a young person can achieve, and I'd say that this is pretty universally agreed upon among the VC sort of class in Silicon Valley, is getting into the Peter Thiel Fellowship. Yeah. It is a much bigger deal than, you know, having a, a Harvard degree or something like that among the young. And it's interesting because we've seen this repeatedly in terms of like new status symbols among youth where the highest form of status symbol comes from programs where somebody is giving the youth money. Like the new one is like the, the Atlas Fellowships, a pretty high status symbol. Like after the Teal Fellowship, then it's probably the, the Atlas Fellowship. And it's because in, in a world where, and it's actually kind of crazy to think about it, that historically you would, we, we judge status on people would pay for that status. But now obviously status should be better judged on who's going to give you money. Yeah, right. seriously. 
<clears throat> that's a and, that's a really good point. I, I wonder <laughs> if you had any thoughts on the fall of the current academic system and whether or not you think it still has utility. I think hierarchies are are best in a stable environment where they are hierarchies of competence. They have not degraded into corruption or incompetence. In and and if it, let's say a, a hierarchy exists to solve a problem. If, if, if it is still solving that problem and you can judge people based on merit accurately, then it can be stable over time. And, 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 it, oh, and with that comes visibility, intelligibility in the way people talk about their lives and careers. And it, it just makes sense out there. And I think college fit that for a long time, but people didn't notice that it became corrupted and that it wasn't solving the, you know, the problem it used to solve. And then maybe it's incompetent too. But nevertheless, like this lingering hierarchy that still has status, status and prestige is there. So people are entering it. Um, whereas in a chaotic environment, which is the, the, the environment of innovation, dynamism, creativity, these hierarchies should come and go just based on, on who is solving that problem best over some period of time. But you know, it's, that's what it's, God, there are so many issues here. I feel like I'm wondering, but the thing, what I'll say is there's like a difference between excellence and greatness. Excellence is striving to a, attain high grades in a, you know, an environment where there are assignments, essays, tests, these things are very legible, clear, where, and, and you can keep climbing up that hierarchy over the years. And, and maybe, you know, you become a Harvard grad Rhodes scholar. Good for you. You're hired by the bureaucratic state, professional managerial class. You'll make good money. But those types of people aren't the types of people who, you know, write the next great novel or invent, you know, necessarily invent the new, next, you know, big company or something like that. Creativity just comes from a different place. So, you know, that's an old distinction, if I think about it, that goes all the way back to the Iliad. This is the fundamental conflict in that epic poem because it starts off, it's, it's the conflict is actually not, the main conflict of the story is not between the, the Greeks and the Trojans. In fact, it's between two sides of the Greeks. You have Achilles, who represents greatness. He's mm -hmm. widely recognized as the, the, the swiftest, most lethal warrior. And yet he has to operate or work with legitimate, high-status, prestige king, who's also an idiot, Agamemnon. And the, the conflict of the book is Achilles basically you know, shrugs, like Atlas shrugs. Okay, wait, you're incompetent you're treating me poorly and now I'm not going to fight in your war. <laughs> and, and so I think maybe all societies have to find this balance between hierarchies of greatness and hierarchies of prestige where they're going to come into conflict where the, you know, the old prestige ones need to fade away and be replaced by the next wave of the great. But over time, those uh, newcomers become old timers and, and they become corrupt. So it's like we need a process that, that knows how to sift these things out. I, I, I oh, continue. Yeah, no, sorry. That, that, I know that was like abstract and... No, no, uh, I love it. Well, I mean, it's also really cool <laughs> yeah. that I think that, that with the academic system falling, I think a lot of people can see that that's happening, but it's not as clear to many people what's going to replace it. And it is cool mm -hmm. that I think that you played a part in founding this new system, which is already beginning to be replicated. And I think will replace the academic system by the time that our children are growing up mm. as the primary status hierarchy for youth. Now, the second question, which I thought was really interesting, because you know when we were talking with you, how resistant the major publications were to cover your book, or the major sort of, you know, you know given how impactful your work is, I wonder if you could talk a little mm. bit about that, a little bit about the suppression you have when you're in the Peter Thiel sort of yeah. Scenario. Well, we had the haters of the fellowship in 1517 now over a decade. So when the, the Teal Fellowship was first announced in 2010, I think in the same week, we already had op-eds in Newsweek and other magazines denouncing the program as the white man's MBA, corrupting the youth, you know, getting them to focus on money and not you know, the intangible rewards of reading great novels, you know, some, something like that. Then we had Larry Summers, <clears throat> former Treasury Secretary, President of Harvard, come out and denounce the fellowship as the, this is a quote, it's, he says it's the most misdirected philanthropy of the decade. He said that in like 2013 or 14. <laughs> we had numerous bad articles written uh, about us in just about every major publication. Scott Galloway, the, the bloviating commentator on tech, he, he dumped on us. <laughs> So that, that just occurred throughout the decade. But over that time, we just had more and more success. 
And I guess they, those critics faded away, but when I came and there was just silence. And then when I, I had been writing some articles and this agent approached me about writing the book and I, I, I accepted and he was an Englishman, he's based in London. And I think he didn't really understand just how much the press and the media and let's say the cultural establishment from Hollywood to mm -hmm. you know, newspapers and so on, how much that had come to hate tech and in particular hate Peter Thiel. Hmm. So Peter famously backed you know, a lawsuit against Gawker, Hulk Hogan versus Gawker. When that was revealed, the media suddenly thought Peter, Peter was this evil billionaire stifling free speech. And then he supported Trump in 2016. And after both those things, yeah, I, th I think that the intensity of the hatred just reached all new highs. So we and we sent out the proposal for the book. That must have been 2021. And I was shocked. We sent it to 20 publishers, maybe six or seven wrote back. And, and here's another quote that is word for word. Someone wrote, Peter Thiel is evil and anyone who worked for him is is evil so we can't possibly oh. publish this <laughs> yeah. of course <laughs> um a bunch of people yeah they, they they just did not like people peter then another six or seven said i you know someone was said i went to yale i studied english literature i think college is amazing i disagree <laughs> with this book and then you know six or seven just passed because they said it wasn't for them i ended up getting picked up by a small independent publisher encounter and they put out mainly conservative, libertarian-ish, policy wonkish books. Hmm. Tends to be very, you know, blend of academic think tank history sometimes. But this is the first nonfiction, you know, story. You know, I, I wanted to tell a story. I certainly wanted to touch on policy issues like higher ed and, and what might be done. But, but I think it is the first book I've, I've seen them put out where it was like, okay, this is a, a story, <laughs> Some, a business story. But yeah, that was a struggle. And I think it, it represented that symbolic conflict. It was a, a, a symbolic example of this wider conflict between the, the old institutions and, and things that are popping up here and there that are, that are new and I guess threatening to the old order. Yeah. And it's really humorous if you're actually in these spheres because they treat Peter Thiel like he's this big Machiavellian, like a spider web master guy who's, yes. who's uh, <laughs> controlling everything from behind the scenes. So much so that we've even been caught up in this. We got called up by um, a comedian who was pretending to be a reporter and they wanted to do mm. a thing on us. And we we're like, yeah, we're actually like, after he's talking to you, you guys seem so like normal and not evil. Like he was really surprised. I don't think we actually <laughs> yeah, were right. in the comedy piece because he he thought that we were so much nicer than he thought we would be. And he's like, but you know, everyone's going to hate you because of those, those Peter yeah. Thiel connections. So, so our connection there is Simone used to be the managing director of Ta Dialogue, which was a secret society thing that was originally founded mm. by Peter Thiel. Tentative, long-term connection. This was back in his Aaron Hoffman days, so it's founded by Peter Thiel mm. and Aaron Hoffman together. But anyway, so so he was talking to us, he goes, because you have that, everyone is always like, how could you have possibly worked in any way tied to the sphere of this villain? Yeah. And what's crazy is that you're in these sort of circles, he actually just isn't that involved with a lot of his projects, and he mm. definitely is not as a, a web spider mastery sort of operator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Uh, so that that was something I I wanted to portray in the book was just I had the fortune of working with Peter for directly for him for five years. He's an investor in fifteen seventeen, and we you know, are friendly and meet every so often. And and the derangement syndrome around Peter in the media and the way they portrayed him, everything from I mean they they make him seem like he's this vol rational Vulcan who has no feelings whatsoever. <laughs> And then there is, a, what you're pointing out is, is funny. They do always want to portray him as this, this mastermind chess master who, who sees six moves ahead. And, and one of the funnier moments I've had with Peter was, I, I said that to him. This was during the Gawker, the time of when it was revealed, he, he backed that lawsuit. And, and he asked me, he said, oh, what do you think of the, the, the coverage and I said, oh, you know, it's so interesting. No one wants to debate you on the constitutional issues of privacy versus speech. Instead, they're just obsessed with portraying you as this chess master operating from the shadows, seeing six moves ahead. And then Peter says to me, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
So actually, this yeah. really <laughs> parallel that happened in my life was a different cultural group. So yeah. I was a director of strategy of the Ventures, which was the most successful early stage venture capital firm in Korea during the period. And we okay. were always getting into fights with the government to the extent that the fund was eventually shut down by, by government action over something that was later proven to be completely mm. falsified. And the courts admitted it was all falsified. But anyway... Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. are like, why were you in this conflict with the government? Politically, why were you so toxic? And it was like, well, we came up with this really crazy investment strategy, which is we would invest in people who had dropped out of college or who mm. didn't go to good colleges. And in Korea, these people are persona non grata, much more wow, so than yeah. they are in the United States. Yes, and yes. We were seen as sort of disrupting societal order in helping people that shouldn't get rich get rich. Because in Korea, the society is so much more hierarchical. You mm. still have the tribals and the tribals. It's, it, it, it's much more somebody getting a bunch of money out of nowhere, especially somebody who dropped out of college, is genuinely seen as a social ill. Yeah. What is interesting, and I think Peter Thiel, where he's actually been most successful, is in identifying incompetent people who do not fit into the game of bowing to the, the systems of power mm. in our society right now. So a lot of the time, these people would be filtered out. They'd be filtered out sometimes of elite institutions. They'd be filtered out of, of being allowed to write books or run funds. But he's mm. able to look past all that. And because of that, he has access to a much wider and often a much more honest talent pool than anyone else can access. Yeah. God, yeah, that's funny about Korea. One of, one of the cool interactions that I've had with my book being out in the world is I was doing a Zoom discussion with some people who had read it and, and this happened off Twitter. So the link went out to all sorts of people. And this young man who called in was actually a soldier in the Korean army. And mm -hmm. he was calling from this base somewhere in Korea. And, and he wanted to let me know that he's having the best time reading out passages of my book to his bunk mates in the army and they're laughing their asses off and they couldn't believe that someone was saying what I was saying in the book or you know, all the things we've touched on about, okay, maybe college isn't best for all. <laughs> or, and, and, and I think that's right. You, 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 they are just manic for university, the university path in Korea. So the, the, the heresy is just even more hilar hilarious to the few yeah. or shocking to others. Uh, what, 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 I, what I found the parallel there is I think mm. in the U.S. we can see how comical it is that, oh, yeah, if you see this talent pool that everyone else is ignoring, of course you're mm. going to do well. Like, it's the easiest arbitrage opportunity <laughs> in the world. And then in the U.S., you're like, well, what if you invest in people who sometimes have conservative opinions? It's like, uh oh, that's a that's a that's a spicy take. Definitely don't do that. Yeah, but it's literally the position that we have lost venture capital funding for mm. our school for being publicly conservative. Um, wow. Like, this is something that actually happens in the U.S. People are like, hey, we just can't be seen as identifying mm -hmm. with conservatives. And also in the nonprofit space, this is something we consistently saw. We were working for a big nonprofit at one time, and I don't want to say which one this was, mm -hmm. but they basically said when they found out that uh, we had you know, a conservative history that we couldn't work for them anymore because it was too dangerous for, for wow. their work to continue to get funding. Yeah. Because so many of the power structures in like the nonprofit space within the U.S. Mm -hmm. are just completely... And as we, as we point this out was in nonprofit structures, if you have, like when people go into nonprofits, they typically have two motivations. Some of them are interested in making the world a better place. And some of them are interested in playing like status signal hierarchy, moving mm. up within sort of this, this status of society. The people who are interested in making the world a better place, you know, they need to split their time within the nonprofit between social politics and actually trying to do something efficacious. Whereas the people who care only about personal status they can spend their entire time on politics within the organization. And yeah. so within these large bureaucracies, they always end up winning and controlling these mm. organizations, which is, I think, how this group has gained so much power. Right. Yeah, that's, I, it does become a system of control and exclusion. Yeah. And, and I think our, the derangement of our institutions into you know, the woke madness, left-wing, knee-jerk ideology, it's, it, it, I guess it does. It does it for the wise investor. <laughs> it may create an, an opportunity, but but it is sad to me that this has become a a way to exclude. I think. I mean, I, I'm not going to cry too much over my my book, but it is interesting to me that I, I've received no reviews. I couldn't get anyone from normal publications to review the book. I think it's because of this affiliation with Peter Thiel. These ideas, maybe the conservative publisher. 
I think that all has to be factored in, in into it. Uh, it's like clear. And then, and then, I mean, look at Twitter. It doesn't even have to be, it's like cl pretty clear now that, you know, shadow ban conservatives were being shadow banned and pushed yes. out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right. Um, one concept that I really liked from the book, I mean, like it's in the title, is this concept mm -hmm. of the paper belt. Like we right. grew up with the concept of the Rust Belt. This is the, you know, industrial heart of America. And now so much <clears throat> is being run by the paper belt, which is essentially like the media, knowledge mm -hmm. workers, it's sort of like clustered around, around the East Coast, right? You'd yeah. roughly define it that way. And it's, yeah. you know, the book is a lot about subverting this, right? It's about what could come next. Where, you know, after sort of like publishing your book and being attacked by the paper belt <laughs> or resisted by it, I mean, part of me is, yeah, the paper belt is 100% on fire. It's extremely dysfunctional. Right. It's like sabotaging itself. Mm -hmm. And yet you can feel its power, right? Like we can yeah. feel the heat. Like still, right. I can't pretend that it's it's burnt to the ground. And, yeah. And and also, yeah, my mom pointed out to me, she's like, wait, your your book is called Paper Belts on Fire, and you're upset that no one in the paper belt likes the book. <laughs> 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 All right. I was like, hey, you're right, mom. It's fair enough. But but I think the lingering status and prestige of these institutions is strong and they're, and they're not totally incompetent and corrupt. I think they're they're still doing important things like governing the country or providing some, you know, media and, and so on. I, I, I think there is a sense in which, yeah, as people ask me, like, why didn't you just self-publish? Who cares? I think, yeah, I'm not quite sure these old institutions are completely dead and I need to, or wanted to operate within them in order to get the word out. But I get it if they, if they don't want my message uh, coursing through their veins, the, yeah, I, the paper belt is this configuration of power on the East coast from Washington, DC to New York, to Boston. Other people have called it the Acela corridor, I-95. Um, you know, there are other names for these things, but the thing that stood out to me was that they are indeed paper-based everything from the U S dollar to a diploma at Harvard or MIT. And what, uh, when I learned more about just, you know, I, I, I was deep into cypherpunk, you know, blogging and essays. And I, I certainly retain a lot of that, that rebellious vibe from, from the cypherpunk era, but I also just learning a lot about, you know, why was Bitcoin created? How does the blockchain architecture work? And, and I, I came to see that it was very much against these paper-based trust institutions, because if you, if you are relying on paper, whether it's a diploma or a dollar, there's an institution that has to be trusted to verify that that piece of paper has value that it signals something that it's meant to signal, that it hasn't been corrupted or watered down, and, and then that institution validates it. And so that was interesting to me that the paper is tied to the performance of the of these institutions, you know, because we have to, you know, we have to trust them. And it seems to be the case that diplomas don't signal what, you know, these schools claim they do, and that the US dollar doesn't signal <laughs> what the government necessarily wants it to. So that, that, that stood out to me and I wanted to, to run with it that I, I think we do have a, I think institutions are decline, in decline. It's hard to know how to turn them around. Our, our attempt in the book is, with the book that I wanted to depict is, okay, what is it? Okay, here's the analysis, the, the critique of the decline, but what can we do outside of it that, that's creative and inspiring? And I think stories are the best way to inspire people. Yeah. No, totally. Yeah. I'm curious also, how far away you think we are from the next thing, whatever it is exactly mm. after the paper belt, like the network state or this yeah, more right. decentralized world, because it's, it's interesting. I don't know. With the pandemic, mm. we got a lot of hope. We're like, whoa, this could happen really fast. These things are falling apart quickly. You know, we read like Zihan's the, the end of the world is just the beginning. And we're like, holy shit, like everything's going to change. Right. And, and then, you know, things kind of stay the same. Stay um, the same. Carry no, on, we're really right. impatient. You know, it's been like yeah. zero times since the pandemic actually hit. What are your thoughts? Oh. Do you feel like we're close? What do you think I the know. major like tipping points are going to be? Maybe, maybe let's just focus on the institution of school and yeah. education. I think all what you just said is true in that category. The pandemic came and parents came to see that they couldn't trust the bureaucrats or the teachers when it came to you know, providing an education to their children or just, you know, being nice people <laughs> or even being open, right? There were some right. unions that extended the, you know, the closure of the schools and so on. So I, I, a lot of anger and frustration among parents started to, to pick up. And then we saw greater movement into 
either school choice at the state level can, you know, just cut checks to people to send their kids somewhere else, but also homeschooling, I think. I haven't seen the numbers, mm-hmm. but it just seems to me that, you know, more and more people are doing these things and, and, and politicians are running on that issue. But like you said, the legacy institutions are still strong. And in every parent I talk to who isn't, you know, normie parents, like their dream is still, you know, just they judge themselves on how good of a parent they are by, you know, how their children make their way through, you know, K through 12 into, into universities. So yeah. given that that is still so mainstream and just the main path, I think there's a long way to go now. I, but it's okay. We've made a little progress. We've seen how the institution is failing, but people are still buying into it. I think we just need more and more success stories. Just have to keep building on, you know, the, the, the stories about people who are outside of it. I love what you all are doing in terms of, you know, you're another new entry into the field. Okay. Can we help younger people (laughs) earlier and doing different things and, and maybe they don't go to college or maybe they do, but they have a greater focus and, and commitment to something specific. I think well, that, I, that that if we build on this, then, OK, I don't know. I can't put a time range on it, but maybe 10, 20 years, we'll start to see a substantial number of people who choose that path. Okay, that would be amazing. OK. Yeah, so yeah I think that's if, if we like make good missing. alternative systems. Yes. Yeah. So when I, I think something you're missing is if you look at young people today, like if you look at our generation, right, like mm. people had already begun to separate out of the system to the extent where when I look at the people now who have achieved like disproportionate wealth in our society or disproportionate right. positions of power, many of them were in these, you know, 1,000 people, 2,000 people chat rooms in like the early rationalist, less wrong yes. gay <laughs> communities back when I was in Silicon Valley, you know, mm. 20 years ago, right? If I look today, a lot of people can look and they can be like, your channel, are these communities you're swimming in are like really small communities? That mm. doesn't mean that they aren't disproportionately bringing in some of the smartest people. Like when we're in Silicon Valley and I look at things like the Atlas Fellowship and it was really shocking to us because we had a number of people go through our school and every single one of them also then went to the Atlas Fellowship completely independently of us. And, And what that showed me is that we are... When we're out there sourcing, being like, I want the smartest kids in the US, and we have two people who are doing the sourcing, they keep finding the same kids, and all of these kids kind of know each other already. So mm. I do think we live in a world where the smartest people with am- am- ambition and with a- individual agency are actually already beginning to coalesce outside of the old power system. Yeah. And I think that that's the first thing you need. That's the first big step mm. in whatever comes next. Yeah, very, very good point. And, and actually, I, I, I said COVID is one of these catalysts for, for pushing mm-hmm. people out of schools, but we haven't even touched on the, the woke madness and yeah. the ideological indoctrination where I think quite moderate parents don't even want to have to deal with this stuff now. And, and, and maybe that'll accelerate as well. Yeah. We're hearing it a lot. Well, and another thing that I've seen, which does suggest to me, maybe things are moving fairly fast mm. is many very high achieving college age people we know now have enrolled in prestigious universities when mm. they get in, because they feel like that piece of paper will help them. And it probably yeah. still will. But they're also like completely phoning it in. They're oh, like, I'm yeah, not going right. to the classes. I'm just no. teaching myself. This is a complete waste of time. I'm literally here. So once that generation starts raising their own kids, hmm. uh, are they are they going to pay for that when they know what they did? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and we so can't maybe that's yeah. who this person is. But one of our our close friends uh, recently got into Harvard for graduate school, hmm. and she was like, I really don't want to go. What's the point? <laughs> and I go, Look, it just get the slip of paper, okay? Yeah. Um, like you don't need to go to classes. You don't need to do anything. And There's an old joke that it's easier to, what is it? Um, it's harder to get into Harvard than to fail out of it. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I came close with my Stanford MBA a, 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 okay. a trouble a few times. Not failing out, but I, I guess I always yeah. need to piss people off. Uh, I think, well, and one other issue is, I think, is just how bad schools are. And mm-hmm. so it's tough for people to really judge the quality of things when, when it's not clear what difference it makes, but it could be the case and that maybe methods of instruction and methods of building curiosity improve so much that the people who are outside the system are just so clearly far ahead 
along these dimensions mm -hmm. that other people in the system are like, oh shit, I got to get out. I mean, I think like people obviously switch from Uber to Lyft because it was just so wonderful and magical to be able to yeah. call a car, right? Such a big improvement on the old medallion system, paper-based system that, that they, they moved. But now, you know, education is so expensive and then it's not even clear how much of a difference it'll make. You know, people just want their kids to be with other kids who are pro-social and pro-learning. But, it's, you know, when it comes to methods of instruction, no one's really good at judging these things. But what if you did send your child to a school and they learned calculus in three months instead of a year? I think, you know, people, if they saw that, they'd say, well, all right, I want to send my kid there. But we just don't have that yet. Well, our school's going to do that. When, when okay, I, I guarantee you, I just wish we could develop it a little faster. Yeah. Anyway, I have had so much fun talking with you in mm -hmm. this, in this work. We'll definitely do another episode with you. Okay, and, great. Yeah, that um, went fast. <laughs> I would direct people to your book. I would mm -hmm. also direct people to things that you're running. You know, if you know a really young, smart person who's mm -hmm. working on big ideas, stuff like the 1517 fund are actually, or, or the deal fellowship are where it is for the next yeah. generation. And, and, and for our young viewers who are just like, yeah, but I can't, what do you mean you can't? Like mm. the, being a genius in a meaningful context is about having individual agency and being able to go out there, search for opportunities and execute on the opportunities you're searching for. And so, you know, just remember that. Remember to not forget to try. <laughs> yeah. Anyone out there, reach out, 1517fund.com. We have a, a submission form on our website that we answer. And you don't even have to be starting a company. We just want to meet people who are attracted to, you know, this vibe and this world and these ideas. Yeah. Nice. Thank well, you so much, Michael. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.